As we're turning to the Gospel of John chapter 20, I'd like to mention that we've been through a series of messages referring to the King as coming that began with talk about, talking about rejecting the King. And then we looked at the message receiving the King. And as we dealt with receiving the King that launched us into rebuking the King and we found out how easy it is in our lives to rebuke what it is that Jesus is purposing to do through our lives. We then looked at a message called reverencing the King and then remembering the King which followed with the Lord's Supper prior to Resurrection Sunday. We then looked at a two-part message on the resurrection of the King and last week's message on the resurrection dealt with the resurrection that brought power to faith's profession and how the resurrection of Jesus Christ empowers us to live for Him in so many different areas of our lives. Today we're looking at a message called Regrouping for the King. Regrouping for the King. And as we enter into this message, we are beginning in John chapter 20. And as we look at John chapter 20, we're going to look towards the end of that chapter to pick up with an after-resurrection story where Jesus is meeting with His disciples. It says in verse number 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Then look at verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Digimus, that simply means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples therefore said unto him, unto Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side. Notice what he says, I will not believe. Here's one of the disciples that followed Jesus. And in such a stubborn response, he rejects the testimony of his comrades, the testimony of his other friends that he had walked with for a few years now. Then it says in verse number 26, after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And he said, Be not faithless, but believe him. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us to regroup for the glory of God. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we see these men in the passage who were so close to you at one time, but now they're apart from you because of the death, burial, and the now the resurrection. You have appeared unto them so graciously and yet there's still fear and yet there's still one who will not believe but is doubting you. I pray that you would teach us what this is all about and show us as believers today where we fall into this passage and help us to be obedient to respond as you would have us to respond. We ask that you would be glorified in our midst today and we pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said... Amen. Now, I want you to notice in this passage that they did not need to regroup in the physical fashion. They were gathered together much like we are today. But even though they were gathered together, there were some things on the spiritual side that needed to be restored. And again, the emphasis is today we have gathered together, yes, but we may need to regroup. We may need to regather. There may need to be some areas of our life that need revival or need to be mended because we have separated ourselves from how close we used to be with the things of God. 
I don't know what happened last week in your life. I don't know what happened to you by others last week in your life. But something maybe has put a wedge or driven a wedge between you and God. And today God is extending that second chance. Today God is extending that opportunity for an old-fashioned revival in your heart where you can regroup for the glory of God. As I look at the first point, regrouping when fearful, I realize today that fear is one of the things that can cause us spiritually to need revival, spiritually to need restoration, spiritually to need a mending. Notice what it says in verse number 19 of John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for what church? Fear. Here's a people who are gathered, yes, but as they are gathered, they are fearful. Now let's put ourselves maybe in 2018 in a different country. And let's realize that in our country today, we are not presently worried about that door being knocked through and this place gassed or this place bombed. And we say praise the Lord that we didn't gather with fear of that today. But there are churches in 2018 that are facing gathering together in fear. They are still gathering, but there is a fear that is driving a wedge between them and maybe their relationship with God, but yet they are still gathered. As we look at verse 19, they are gathered together for fear of the Jews. It, it were the Jews that put Jesus on the cross. It were they that said, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, well, what has he now done? I find no fault in him. He came unto his own, didn't he? But his own received him not. And these disciples are gathering together in the upper room. Peter has denied uh, that he was even with Jesus. He said, I know not the man. And now they gather together in fear of the same ones that took Jesus' life. Will they take ours as well? Letter A, first of all, I want you to see fear within. Take your Bible and go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. As we talk about the fear that was within the heart of the disciples that day, as they were gathered in that room and Jesus' presence was not yet felt, we are reminded that every single one of us can have a fear within, but God, through Jesus' gospel, wants to take that fear and drive it far from us. As we talk about a fear within, we are reminded of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7. Notice what God has to say. And if you struggle with fear, this would be a very good verse to memorize today. In verse number 7, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of what, church? God hath not given it to us. You better rest assured that if there's any fear in your life, it's not from God, but it's from another source. And guess what? God is greater than any other source that has ever come into this world. God is greater than other men. God is greater than those you're close to. God is greater than your greatest fear. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. But notice what He's given you. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. If there's anything God wants to gift you today, Day with It is that power, it is that love, and that is a sound mind, even though everything is going around in calamity and storms around you. He wants you to know today that you can live in victory over that storm. You can rise above it. You can find yourself in a place where all fear is dissipated because of who He is. They were gathered together for fear of the Jews. There was a fear within, but let her be. Secondly, there was a fear without. Take your Bible and go to Matthew chapter 10, the Gospel of Matthew. This is the first book of the New Testament. And I want you to notice what Jesus says about the fear without. I remind you in our passage of study that the disciples were gathered together for fear of a particular people group, fear of the Jews. These are a people group that they were very familiar with. This was their own people group. And their own people group is coming against them. Their own 
people group doesn't like what they have to say because of in whom they have believed. Because they believed in Jesus Christ and followed Jesus Christ, they now find themselves in a position where they could be very fearful within and therefore very fearful without. In Matthew chapter 10, the Bible says this in verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the what, church? The soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. If there's anyone that is to be feared today, it is God. A proper godly fear that is found in your life is the one that said, Yes, I am a sinner, but God is the Savior through Jesus Christ, and I'm done running in my pride, and I'm done running in my arrogancy, and I'm done running in my ignorance, and maybe even done running in my mockery and my cruelty to the way of God and coming to God in proper fear and saying God I understand you are the giver and taker of life God I understand you are the keeper of the soul and I submit myself unto you Jesus has given a teaching on fear you know within God doesn't want you to have that fear he wants you to have power and love and a sound mind but without as people begin to etch away and, and knock away at your spirituality with this thing called fear that Jesus would say to us today like he did to his disciples he would say you don't have to fear them which kill the body there's a heaven awaiting you child of God there's a home eternal in the heavens for those who know God you have a peace and you can rest assured that no matter what man does unto you God is on your side you can be on God's side and you can have a peace in the midst of the storm when others are threatening your life. The command again in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not them which kill the body. This is easy for us to do if we're not living for the things of this world. But if we're living for the things of this world, we've got attachments here and attachments there. And I wouldn't want anybody to pass away, and I don't like it when death strikes. But I sure am glad to know that there's more life than we have ever experienced on the other side of eternity than the life that I have experienced on this side of eternity. There's comfort found in God, but the disciples were gathered together because of fear. Now as we move to 1 John, we're going to go to our second point this morning. There's a regrouping when fearful, but notice there's a regrouping through fellowship. It says in 1 John chapter 1, I want you to look at verse number 3. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 3. The Bible says and in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 3, that, talking about Jesus, which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that this same John that is writing 1 John is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. It's the same John that was gathered together for fear of the Jews in the upper room. But as I think about him gathering together with the other disciples, this second point is so necessary for us to understand. They were regrouping through fellowship. They were finding strength through being together for the glory of God. As we look at verse number 3, this fellowship is with with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the two different avenues of fellowship. Fellowship with physical people, fellowship with a spiritual God. Because of the death of Jesus Christ, the three days later resurrection, you and I have a tie that binds us together closer than even a physical relationship. It's a tie that binds us together for all of eternity. And when I am fearful, I can go to fellowship with you and when I'm fearful I can go to fellowship with God and I can find peace in the midst of the storm and notice this in Acts chapter 27 and verse number 3 first I want to share with you fellowship with others can ease fear fellowship with others and I can go to the extent to say fellowship with others of like faith notice this in Acts 27 
Paul is a man that went through so much. He went through more than many a preacher will ever go through in 2018. Not saying there's preachers today who won't go through such things. But Paul faced so much at the hand of preaching the gospel. If you look at Acts 27 in verse number 3, the Bible says, And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends. To what church? Refresh himself. Hey, when I talk about regrouping through fellowship with others of the faith, here is a man in the Word of God that said, If there's anybody I want to go to, it's going to be my friends in the faith. For when I'm with my friends in the faith, I find encouragement for the journey ahead. When I'm with my friends in the faith, I find encouragement to go even to the shopping block for the glory of God. When I'm with my friends in the faith, it encourages me to keep on living for the glory of God. Steve and Tim gave me the testimony up there in Alaska as two other men have been staying with them. One man that's been staying with them in the Penix house is a pastor from one of the village churches in Bush, Alaska. And the other man that's been staying with them is all the way from Maine who is also a master builder as well, a construction young man. And as Tim and Steve have been getting together with Tim and Israel, they told me, Pastor, it's been good to see and to hear the whole heart that these other two men have for the glory of God. One of them is a single young man who's looking for a bride. The other one's a pastor of a church in a village with a family. And they said it's just so awesome to meet two young men that want to serve the Lord. It's been encouraging to us. That's what the family of God does for one another. It doesn't discourage you from serving God. If it's done right it encourages you. It refreshes you. It strengthens you in the faith and causes you to move forward but I'm saying this today friends that our fellowship ought to be more than just with each other we have a fellowship with God that changes things take your Bible and go back to John chapter 20 with me this is the passage that we started looking at talking about the story of Jesus resurrected meeting with the disciples who were scared to death they were assembled together they were fellowshipping together but they were in fear Notice letter B, secondly, fellowship with Jesus dissipates fear. Notice what it says in John 20 verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Friends, I'm preaching again that the way of Jesus Christ is not the way of death, but is the way of life. The way of Jesus Christ is not the way of fear, but is the way of peace. And as we see him approaching the upper room scenario, he finds disciples within who are scared to death. Maybe he hears the words from the disciples, I wonder if the Jews are going to come. I wonder if it's going to be tonight. I wonder if that door's going to fling open. I wonder if the hand of the Romans are going to come like they took Jesus. I I wonder today if I'm going to face the end of my life. But at the very moment that fear was within and fear was without for other people, we find that Jesus enters into the room. Can I say it was the presence of Jesus that gave the peace to the disciples that they needed? Can I encourage you today that no matter what you're going through, the presence of God is something that you need to get around. The presence of God is something that you need in your life. You ought to set yourself up for success in the spiritual life by getting to the places in your life that are going to challenge you and change you for the glory of God. That may be the church house where you gather together with others and worship. The presence of God ought to be found within the church house. House. Amen. But it ought to be that you have other areas in your life where you get alone with God and you find yourself to have encouragement because of the presence of the Lord that is there. Think about this. Turn to Psalm 16 with me. Psalm 16. And I want you to notice an Old Testament man of God that did something very unique that obviously helped him. I want you to think about David for just a second. 
The one that took the stone and a sling and that sling went round and round and he had a faith that took out the giant Goliath in his life. But years down the road he would face fear. It actually wasn't that long down the road and he'd face fear at the hand of King Saul. And he'd run through the wildernesses and hide in the caves for fear of his own people who were taken after him and trying to take his life. I want to give you the key to David's success when he could have been fearful. Look at Psalm 16 and verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Let me read it again. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. Notice this last phrase. I shall not be moved. Then look at verse number 9. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Here's a man of God, uh, David, who would lift up his voice and say, I I could allow myself to be in fear. I could let the enemy conquer me. But right now today, I can have peace. I can have joy. I can have gladness because I take God and I set God before me. The presence of of the Lord is purposed in my life. And I ask you this question, search your heart really good. What are you always setting before yourself? Are the things of God, is the word of God something that sometimes pops in? Or is it something that you purpose in your life, that you set before yourself, and therefore the presence of God there? Therefore, you will not be moved when the hard times come. I say it again, there's been many a believer over the years of my ministry who has found themselves in the place of almost being removed from fellowship. And there have been many who have who I've gone back to churches and when I step through those church doors, it's not that they can't be found in another church, they can't be found in another church at all. They let something enter into their life that would detour them and distract them and keep them from where they ought to be. Remember how we ended last week that the Lord is the victor but thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ therefore be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of God here's how you are steadfast set the Lord always before you make him a priority When He is your priority and He is the presence that is before you, you can stand, you can be steadfast, you won't be moved. But if I set other things before me, I am liable to be removed from my stand with Him. As I go back to John chapter 20, I read verse 19 to you again. And I talk about the presence of Jesus Christ and how it dissipates fear. It says in John chapter 20 verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Uh, Sometimes we like to throw the verse around that says, uh, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Uh, Friends, he's with you at all times. He's never left you nor forsaken you. That passage is dealing with reconciliation and forgiveness. That when two people come together or three people come together, Jesus is in the middle of restoration. Jesus is in the middle of forgiveness. Here again is another picture in the Word of God where people are gathered gathered together and Jesus' presence enters in and when Jesus' presence enters in, peace, peace. I've had people come into Crossroads Baptist Church and they tell me, Pastor, my life is such a mess right now. My life is such a wreck right now. But when I come into the house of God, I forget about all those things. That's what the peace of God can do in your life. 
But the peace of God doesn't have to just be found in this auditorium. The peace of God can be experienced in any area of your life, wherever you are at. Just give it over to God and let the peace that passeth all understanding comfort your heart. One of the ways that we misuse the Spirit of God is by not allowing Him to be one of the main things He's created to be. The Spirit of God is called the Comforter by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Jesus says, I send them to you another comforter. And when he comes, you shall have comfort. Today, friends, the Spirit of God, yes, he wants to convict. Yes, he wants to rebuke. Yes, he wants to be somebody that brings you to where you ought to be in salvation or the Christian life. But he also wants to give you comfort in a world that is fearful. In a world that is trying, he wants to minister to your soul. I think sometimes the reason why he's not the comforter he ought to be is because we constantly fall into that abusing the grace of God. And instead of taking God's comfort right now, I need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I need him to work on my heart because I've done it again. I'm living blatantly in a way I should not live. The Spirit of God's knocking at my heart's door. You ought to get right. The Spirit of God wants to do more than teach us how to get right and what is right. He wants to give us comfort. In the midst of our trial, it is amazing to me today how many young people are facing fear. Fears that a hundred years ago they wouldn't have to face. Fears that have been interjected into their life because of decisions to live against the word of God and the way of God by family members. And now there's a fear that is placed into their life that God created the family to protect. But instead the fear is entered in and now young people grow up with such a fear that it drives them away from the God of heaven. And they question God and they say, if there really were a God... This would not be happening to me. If there really were a God, I wouldn't go through what I've been going through. And they grow up in such a place that eventually God is a perfect gentleman would allow them to continue in that reprobate mind. And God will even give them over to a reprobate mind to where they will not do the things that they should do in this life as Romans 1 talks about. Friends, fellowship with God, it dissipates fear. It brings peace and it brings power. It brings freedom from fear. In verse number 20, it brings freedom from sorrow. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. This freedom from sorrow then led to freedom to serve. As Jesus said in verse 21, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. This freedom from fear brought a peace. This freedom from fear took away sorrow. This freedom from fear, it gave them the reason to serve. Regrouping through fear, regrouping through fellowship, and then number three, regrouping through faith. Regrouping through faith. Now, I want you to look at this letter A, tardiness. Notice what it says in in verse number 21. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. In verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. You know what would have solved Thomas's problem in the first place? It would have been if he would have been gathered together with the other disciples. We wouldn't have the story of a doubting Thomas if Thomas would have been present. So as we talk about his tardiness, Thomas comes into the situation and the Bible says in verse 25, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. You know what this situation is like? It's like somebody who comes to Crossroads Baptist Church and they get saved. They're so excited. God has rescued me. I'm born again. I now have a peace that passeth all understanding. Let me go tell my family. And sometimes when you go tell your family, it's like brick wall. All of that excitement falls to the ground. They're not excited for you. 
Might I remind you, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. The like and understanding and illustration is this. The disciples have seen the Lord and were so excited. Thomas, Thomas, you missed it. Jesus was here. He is alive. And then they hit the brick wall of Thomas's doubt. Guys, I'm just not going to believe unless I see him. Unless I can take my finger and put it through his hands. Unless I can take my hand and put it through his side where the spear went. I will not believe. In stubbornness, he was adamant about the fact. He's gone. He left us. And I am going to remain in this doubt unless he shows himself to me. Sometimes there's people who come into this room and we can look at Thomas and say, Thomas, oh, how foolish. But we're looking hindsight. Sometimes people come into Crossroads Baptist Church and they find themselves in the same place. The preacher preaches his heart and preaches a message, but they leave this place and they say, I I just, I don't see the need for that or I don't see the reason to do that. I'm just not going to. It's It's a stubbornness of heart. It is a doubt that is within. If I ever would do that, well, I just, I'm just not going to do that because I just don't believe it to be so. See, it is the word of God by which our faith comes. And child of 2018, if there's anything that we need to take a grip on, if there's anything that we need to understand, it is the word of God. It can't be man's philosophy. It can't be man's way. But if God said it, that settles it, whether we believe it or not. And I hope, I hope we believe it. As I think about this tardiness, this tardiness led to doubt when faith could have been experienced. You know how it is in your life when you start getting a little bit further away from where you need to be and a little bit further away from where you need to be. At first, the Spirit of God's voice is pretty strong. I mean, it is a still, small voice, but you can hear it a lot clearer. But the further you move away and the further you move away, the further away from that voice of the Spirit you get, He's still speaking to you, but your ears are loaded down with the way of the world and the way of the flesh and maybe even the way of the devil. And all of those things do not promote the word of God. They do not promote the way of the spirit. And you find yourself in a situation where you come to a crossroads. Either it is get right with God and back to what you used to know. And back to revival and the sweet way of life with him. Or continue down the road that Proverbs calls the road to destruction. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. As I think about the tardiness that led to doubt when faith could have been experienced, I then move on to a second thing, letter B, Thomas's doubt. And I want you to see mainly that Thomas's doubt was given a second chance. Look at verse 26. And after eight days, if you do a numerical study in the Word of God, eight is the number for grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You look throughout the word of God and you find the number eight to be a number of grace. And here I want you to see that God was gracious in Thomas's life to come back and reveal himself unto Thomas. It's not that he needed to meet Thomas at Thomas's wishes, but he loved Thomas so much that he was willing to come and appear back unto him. Look at what it says in verse 26. And after eight days again his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now before I go any further, you see that phrase, the doors being shut? I sure am glad today. That when man has shut their door unto God, that God is able to move through that facade. And God is able to enter in and still whisper the words of peace to the soul that is in need. It may be in your life you've shut the door to God. I realize that God is a perfect gentleman. But God still wants to speak to you. God wants to give you a second chance. God doesn't want you to turn his back on him again. God wants to extend that grace unto you and that mercy unto you that you may know eternal peace. 
Look at what happens in Thomas's life in verse 27. Then here's what Jesus said. Then he saith unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger. Wait a second. It's almost as if Jesus knew what Thomas was thinking. It's almost as if Jesus knew what Thomas had said. It's almost as if Jesus knows everything about Thomas. Doesn't he know everything about all of us? Isn't it good to know that he'll meet us at our need? And this is where the encouragement is. The disciples, they weren't going. Now, I don't know, it doesn't say anything. It doesn't say that they were praying, Lord, would you help Thomas? Thomas said, it doesn't say anything like that. And I understand that God knows everything, which comforts me in this way. There's people out there who I know are living so against God in a specific way. Isn't it neat to know that God knows how to reach those people? It's, it's going to be the gospel that saves them, but isn't it neat to understand the testimony and how God brings them to salvation? For Thomas, it was they needed to, he needed to see Jesus. He needed to put his, his finger through his hands and his hand through Jesus' side, and Jesus allowed that to happen so this man could come. It's not like God's up there in heaven trying to devise ways to keep people out of heaven. That's not how your God works. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And He wants to reach people. And that's why some people have been able to reach people that you can never reach. He knows how to use people through the gospel to bring people unto Himself. And here Jesus appears to Thomas and Jesus gives him a second chance. As eight is the number of grace, God was certainly gracious to come around the second time and reach him to Thomas' life with His resurrected person. It says in verse 28, at the end of the verse, thrust it into my side, your hand thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. He points out Thomas for who he really was, a faithless person. Somebody who would not believe. He says, Thomas, you need to be someone of faith. You do not need to be someone of doubt. Now, in the scriptures, we see two different types of reactions when Jesus was preached like that. Either believe or have doubt. There's people in the Bible who, when they were left at that ultimatum, they chose to reject. But here is a man who had walked with Jesus who doubted because he didn't see him. And now he sees Jesus and he hears the word from God. That, Thomas, you're faithless. What you need is to be full of faith. You need to believe. Thomas could have said, oh, how dare you tell me the truth about myself? That's how some of us are. How dare you, God, reveal who I really am. I'm not going to that church anymore because when the preacher preaches, it seems like he read my Facebook page all day. Well, you put it on there. No, I, I don't do that. I don't do that. But when I look at the Word of God, I see that God knows everything about us. Amen. God searches the heart of man. God knows Thomas's doubt was graciously given another chance. And let me say lastly, see the testimony of adoration that's given to Jesus is seen in verse number 27 and 28 and 29. Look specifically at 28. And when Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Before we get to the end of 29, notice 28 again. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He needed that experience. He needed that opportunity of grace where he laid his eyes on Jesus. And as Jesus appeared unto him, you have to imagine the shame that he felt. You have to imagine that he understood he was faithless because here's Jesus. There's the prince in his hands. There's the prince in his side. And he falls down before him and he lifts up his voice and he says, My Lord and my God. Notice the difference. And who he was before to who he is now. I'm not going to believe. And now I believe. And now I adore you. And now I love you. That's what God does to a true believer. When they trust in Christ, they are now in adoration of the fact that he would give them a second chance. That he would save their soul. And the true believer says, Lord, I want to adore you. Now here's what the Lord teaches us through the faithlessness of Thomas. In verse 29, here's what he's teaching Thomas. Or 27. 
He says, Be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Aren't you glad that that's in there? There's still people out there today that say, well, I'll believe if I see him. But Jesus' own words were this, hey friend, you're blessed. If you believe in the gospel, even though you haven't seen the Lord Jesus Christ. That's encouragement today. If I were to go up to a teenager in this room and, and give them a $100 bill, which I don't have, but if I were to do that, that would be a blessing in your life, wouldn't it? Pastor just gave me a $100 bill. That's not a curse. That's a blessing. might be a curse for mom and dad, depending on what you buy with it. But it's a blessing from pastor to you. Praise the Lord. Something that you're excited about, something that you're happy to receive here is Jesus saying to Thomas, hey, there's going to be people that come after you for generation and generation that believe, and they are a blessed, they are an oh how happy kind of people, and they won't even lay eyes on me. Church, that's who you are today. You are blessed by Jesus Christ. You haven't seen, but yet you have seen through the word of God that you can be like uh, John who wrote Amazing Grace. And as he once wrote Amazing Grace, he said, I once was blind, but now I see. John didn't have to see Jesus as he pinned down the words to Amazing Grace. He saw him through the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Maybe today we need to regroup. Maybe there's an area of our life that we've been tardy with and we need to come to the realization that we need to be present and we need Jesus to be present in our life. Maybe there's an area where we are fearful, fearful within, fearful without, and we need to let the peace that passeth all understanding minister to our souls. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to live by faith and to tell the world about Jesus in anticipation that maybe we'll hit a block wall. But if we have believed and have received, we've got every reason to be encouraged today, even though others doubt them. You know what's coming. They obviously don't. And we pray that they realize they know what's coming. So we have opportunity to minister unto them. As we move into revival services next week, may we regroup for the glory of God. Gathered together, yes, but gathered together as a spiritually minded people. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, we thank you for the ministry of the Word of God. We thank you for how you encourage us, how you comfort us. We thank you that you can take away that fear. And maybe there's somebody in here today who's very fearful over something. It would be my prayer that you minister to them the way of peace. Maybe it's somebody who needs to be born again. They need to trust you as their Savior. They need to come unto you before it's too late. Minister peace. Maybe there's a child of God who's walking through the storm of life and they need to find peace, peace for their soul. Lord, I pray that we would not be full of doubt today, but that we would be full of of faith and I ask it in Jesus name let's stand together